things strange, unexpected, mysterious, but not to be denied. Join me now and take one step beyond. Around the lives of all great men, history weaves romantic and colorful stories. Many are based on fact, and some are pure imagination. There are many wonderful stories told about the man who, for one terrible and momentous winter, occupied this house. But none is so little known or awe-inspiring as the events that took place here one evening. Our very existence, as well as our future, is largely dependent on that remarkable night of decision. Sure, sure, Gypsy. We'll all die sooner or later. But what about those supply wagons from Easton? Do they bring in good salt pork to fill our bellies? Fresh clothes to put on our backs? There will be no supply wagons. I see only hunger, suffering, and death. I see quite a bit of suffering for you too, Gypsy. We were told to stay out of camp. You and your ragtailed friends with your tales of doom. Be careful, Bobis. Careful! They'll be coming at us through those trees. Take cover! Take cover! Oh, Molly. That's all right. I'll be back before spring plow. What'll they do to them? The whip. Valley Forge. December, 1777. The winter of despair was just beginning. Returned from Easton, sir. Was there something else, Lieutenant? us to go on fighting without food and supplies? That is precisely the point, Colonel. I believe those supply wagons were deliberately cancelled. Supplies are ample, but a large element in the Continental Congress would like us to give up. This is a form of persuasion. Persuasion? The British are tired of this war, too. Congress has been contacted by agents of the British with an offer that grants every one of our demands. Everything except independence. And is Congress ready to settle for that? A good many gentlemen in the Congress are. In the face of it, sir, why do you go on? Are you ready to give up, Colonel? Lee? What is that about? It's another one of those gypsies, sir. A fortune teller. This one told some of the men that the supply wagons will never arrive. By whose order is he being flogged? Major Warren, sir. The order is countermanded. Sir. Certainly you don't put any credence in that sort of thing, Danforth. Well, no, sir, but... He could have learned about those wagons in a hundred different ways. General, this group that wants to quit, just how important are they in Congress? Very important. They are still considerably in the minority, but they are making themselves felt. 
They even asked me for support. You? Well, you refused, of course. Oh, yes. Yes, I refused. But I don't know that I had the right. Sir? There are 12,000 men here in rags, Colonel, and starving. Shouldn't they be consulted about any settlement? 500 of them die every month of disease and privation. There is little glory or satisfaction in that kind of death. But then, of course, there are the dead. I wonder how they would feel about our settling for anything less than they died for. I don't know which side of the question you favor, sir. To be honest, Colonel, at this moment, I do not know myself. the fate of so many, of so much. Help me. Help me. Your God has come to your aid before. He will again. I am Otunkas, chief of Shawnee. Otunkas. Twenty-two summers have come and gone since we met. Battle of Monongahela. Yes, of course. July 1755. I was leading a detachment of Virginians under the command of General Braddock. Redcoats stood tall in sunlight like field of dry corn waiting for harvest night. Yes, it was a slaughter. We lost half the entire British colonial army that day. All British officers in field fell, dead or wounded, all but you, Washington. Yes, I remember well. Otumkus fired at Washington again and again. Fifteen bullets at the heart. Not one found its mark. It has caused Totumkas much wonder. I was very fortunate that day. Not fortune. The great spirit protected Washington that day for good and great purpose. I wish I could believe that. Believe it. back to our farms where we can be of some good to somebody. You will be shot down before you can get a hundred yards. Maybe, but it's better than slow starvation for a lost cause. We're going home, General. 
We found out the gypsy was right about those supply wagons, too. We're going home. I go. Go. If we have sunk to the level of animals, turning one upon another, then perhaps our cause is already lost. They're coming through the trees. Hold. Ah, I meant to get to the chicken soon, only Jason hurt his knee up by the crick in the south pasture. I'll get to it sooner tomorrow. I've never considered myself a mystic, mon général. But I can find no ready explanation for what impressed that Indian so profoundly. What did he say about that battle was all the truth, was it not? Oh, my dear Lafayette, he must have been just a creation in my own troubled mind. He must have been. There were no footprints in the snow. And Tom Carson is supposed to have died in his own village two years ago. And what if he did? What if he did? That bullet hole in your cloak would be proof of his belief in your invulnerability. His belief? A man dead two years? <laughs> We're talking nonsense. An hallucination caused by remembering an impressive day in my youth. How many battles have you been in, Mon General? Oh, scores, perhaps hundreds. Eh bien. How many times have you been wounded? Never. Oh, this has been a day of madness. First me, then you. The gypsies' predictions. A visit from a dead Indian. Yet. And yet, I can remember very well the words I wrote in a letter to my brother after that battle. I said, by the all-powerful dispensations of providence. I have been protected beyond all human possibility and expectation. Beyond all human possibility. I agree. <laughs> My dear Lafayette, you are an incurable romantic. Mon General, I am a Frenchman. And why should Providence choose me for favors? Well, that you will have to ask Providence. But as for what? As Otumka or his specter inferred, perhaps it was for this particular time and this particular place. To have the stubbornness to continue against the, the most impossible obstacles? Or to find the courage to give up while there's still something left, still something to be gained. When I face the facts with a cold eye, I know, and you do too, that if the British persevere, we shall eventually be crushed by sheer weight of numbers and a bottomless exchequer. Unless your nation enters the war, and that is a fact. And can you promise me that France will come to our aid? I cannot promise that. But I have every hope that... Every hope? What is your latest information? If it's the same as mine, all indications are to the contrary. At the moment, yes. But... This dispatch has arrived, sir. What is it, Bon General? A short letter from Major Williams of General Gates' staff. As a friend and admirer, I feel it my duty to report that a letter to General Gates from General Conway contained the following paragraph. Heaven has been determined to save our country or a weak commanding general and bad counselors would have long since ruined it. But 
That is nothing but talk. It is not even worth your anger. And Conway, <laughs> you know what an old woman he is. Everybody knows. Uh, he is bitter and envious of your position. He tried merely to make the difficulties. There's more. You will be interested to know that General Conway has just been selected Inspector General. Conway, Inspector General? Conway will now be spokesman to the Congress, Ariani. Conway will plead our cause for supplies. Conway will advise Congress as to the wisdom of my strategies. Conway. I will have to address my appeals for help to him. Well, they made their message plain enough. I accept their wish for a stronger commanding general. No. General Washington, you are permitting your emotion to rule reason. You have become a symbol of the revolution. If you turn your back on it now, it will spell nothing but disaster. I am not responsible for the image others create of me. But you are responsible to your best self. General Washington. I, my friend, please do not act in haste and anger. Lee, sir? Every officer on my staff is to be here for an urgent meeting at nine sharp. Yes. This is not merely peak. No. I think you are very tired. Tired of fighting the Congress, the intrigues and equities. In addition to all that, the responsibility of waging a war on so many fronts is more than any one man should have to bear. You are no longer able to see things clearly. General Washington. I regret this more than I can say. But I realize that once you have made a decision, it is hopeless to try and dissuade you. I trust my decision will not affect our personal feelings for one another. Nothing could do that. Mon général. a matter of discipline as I see it. Thousands of men wanted to desert weeks ago. Anyway, I can't say I blame the old fox for quitting. If I were the richest man in the colonies and had a beautiful farm where I could take my... Good evening, my... gentlemen.
I would like each of you to consider ways and means of building the morale of the men under your command. Projects to keep them busy. To achieve the highest level of preparation for our spring campaign. Spring campaign? But I thought... You thought what, Major? Well, I assumed that your plans were... Uh, that is, I assumed that your mood was... Uh, pardon me, sir. But we are despairing of the future. If you know something, if you are free to tell us the basis of this sudden optimism, some news about the French, perhaps. News of a victory in the North. There is no news, Colonel. Good or bad. We must make our own good news. But I can say, I am now confident that this war will end in our favor. And with complete victory. Victory? But surely, General, the meeting is adjourned, gentlemen. you why, my friend, you know that I am as hard-headed and practical a man as you have ever known. But... I was sitting here, like this. I put back my head and closed my eyes. But it wasn't just a dream. Because when I opened them, it was still there. I saw our nation victorious. I saw it grow in size and power to become the major force for good on this earth. I saw it. A dream. A vision. I know it will come to pass. In my heart, I know it. A dream? Vision? Whatever it was that George Washington experienced, it has today become all fact. You won't find anything about it in the ordinary history book, but it has appeared in print in a number of versions a number of times during the past 150 years. All versions agree that Washington dreamed the revolution would be successful and that the infant nation would grow until its boundaries stretched from Canada to Mexico and from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And that there would be a bitter civil war between the northern and the southern states to be called the Union and the Confederacy. And that the Union would emerge Victorious. He dreamed all this, supposedly, and more. But what is absolutely no dream are the facts of the Battle of the Monongahela. On this, all versions and all historians agree. There were three bullet holes through his hat. Two horses were shot from under him, and there was a bullet hole through here, through here, through here, and another one. Right through there. Hundreds of French and Indian rifles firing at almost point-blank range throughout that long and dreadful afternoon. And nothing touched him. Nothing. Well, those are the facts. The incredible facts about the mystery of George Washington. Like Chief Otumkus, will always cause us much wonder.